I am uh, pleased to uh, introduce you to Elise Lacan. She came down from Gainesville, and she's the registrar and the assistant department chair at the Florida History, or Florida Museum of Natural History. And she is going to do a program on presenting um, our family heirlooms. And she will include metal objects, ceramics, glass, artwork, textiles, books, and papers, and photographic material, and also audio-visual material. Usually everybody has a few family heirlooms that they'd like to keep, and I think that she will give you some excellent information and some great pointers on how to. So what I want to do tonight is we, we treat our objects at museums in certain ways to preserve them. Our goal is to preserve them in perpetuity, is what we say, and that means for a long, long time. But there are things, you can do the same things or similar things to take care of your own objects that you want to last for generations and you want to pass down in your family. Uh, so what I've done is I brought some samples of the materials that we use, but that you can also order yourself. And I was talking with some of the ladies a little earlier. A lot of the catalogs that I brought, you can order small quantities. You don't have to order in bulk like we do. So I don't um, like to bring things that aren't available to you or that you can't order in small enough quantities for your own use. Um, you, I'll be here after I finish talking, and you can come up to the table. I will also talk take questions when I finish. If you have, if you're confused about something that I'm talking about, or if you have general questions, please feel free to stop me during the presentation. If you've brought an object or you have an object, a particular object to talk about, hold that to the end so that we can really talk about it in detail. Um, so the first thing, um, we all have objects that we collect. Most of us have things that we are special to us that have come down to us from our grandparents or our great-grandparents um, or other people in our families. And they're special to us for various reasons. Um, they may have belonged to a person that's special to you. It may be something about the place or the time that it came from or the memories and the history that that object evokes its beauty, its worth. Sometimes people collect things because of their value, their monetary value. But there's a lot of personal reasons that are specific to us, to us personally, individually. Well, we can't stop time, and we can't stop the natural deterioration of objects. Um, and, but we can slow it down if we take proper care and protective measures to keep these um, to take care of the objects over time. And if you take care of your objects properly, it will um, save you the cost of having to do expensive conservation treatment or losing the object altogether. There are several dis different, um, what we call agents of deterioration. Um, and you need to have a basic understanding of these forces of deterioration and the principles of safekeeping that will help keep your treasures healthy for generations. There are three major areas uh, through which these forces of deterioration attack your objects. So number one is the object's composition. Now we divide objects into various classes and the ceramics, stone, Metals, for example, are what we call inorganic objects. Organic objects are things like textiles, leather, uh, something made of plants, um, baskets, for example. And so those are the two basic categories that most things break down into. So the object's composition um, 
This is a, an archaeological pot. It's ceramic, and so it's fairly stable. Whoops. Okay, I went really far that time. Uh, these are some seminal textiles, and so these are going to be more susceptible to certain things that I'll be talking about later. Another area that affects how objects are preserved is the environment in which the objects are kept. And I'll discuss these in more detail as I go along. And the third major category is how the objects are used. Um, as I said, this is, uh, this is an example of an inorganic object, so it doesn't need as much care. They're inherently more stable. The textiles are not. Um, paper is another organic material. Um, and then there's what we call, whoops, inherent vice. And this is a term that we use to describe objects that break themselves down. For example, paper. There's a lot of paper that was manufactured in the late 19th century into the 20th century, and still today, that's very acidic. The manufacture of paper changed in the 19th century from, um, they used to use uh, rags and cotton to produce paper, and they started using wood. And the material that makes up the wood, as you break it down, and the chemicals that you have to put into the wood to break it down to make paper, make the paper highly acidic. And you can see in this um, slide, this is old scrapbook paper, and how it's become brittle and broken itself down. This is a, one of my old paperbacks, um, and you can look at all this. You can see how this is very brown, and that's because the paper is actually burning itself up the acid in it, and then the moisture from the air creates the acid and burns the paper up. And that's why when you look at old newspapers, old paperbacks, they're usually fairly brown. Um, and you can see how um, this one's I carried around in my sample box, and it's so brittle that pieces of it have broken off through the years. Um, <clears throat> okay. Construction techniques also contribute to uh, how well artifacts are maintained. For example, with this um, military hat, the um, chemicals in the leather can actually corrode the metal um, accoutrements that are on the hat. Um, there's another thing that's going on there with the brim, where it's become dried out and the leather has become brittle over time. So the environment, what does that involve? There are several areas related to environment, humidity and temperature, light, pests, and dust and pollutants. Humidity and temperature are um, one of the most important areas to control. And it depends on the manufacturer or the, the, what the object is made up of as to what kind of humidity and temperature you need. Um, levels of humidity and temperature, the changes can accelerate the deterioration of objects. High humidity levels pr um, promote mold and mildew and corrosion in metals. Um, it's a, an example of some silver. You can see the dark areas on the silver. It's become corroded. Um, and this is a, a Plains Indian piece that the quill work, you can see where it's broken. It's become too dry. And so it's, um, all the quills have broken. And we call that embrittlement. Um, objects like baskets, leather, parchment, ivory, horn, and wood need to, the air to be a little more moist. Uh, if it's too dry, they split, crack, and become brittle. Uh, rapid fluctuations in temperature and humidity can damage an object because it creates, microscopically creates stresses, and the object cannot adjust to those changes. 
So for example, if the temperature has been fairly high during the day and it rapidly decreases and to become very cold, it will get very dry. And the objects can't adjust that fast. Um, temperature is important be because it affects humidity. It affects the amount of moisture that the air can hold. And high temperatures can also accelerate chemical deterioration. So, and this happens all, you can't see this going on uh, until it's already happened and you see it over the course of years. Um, it's, it's, taking, it's taking place in the microscopic structure of the material. Um, for, so for example, paper and photographs and leathers and textiles, baskets, can deteriorate more quickly when they're stored in an attic or in a garage because of the, the changes in the temperature and the humidity. All right. Here we go. So the key to taking care of your objects is to maintain as, as best you can a stable humidity and temperature and avoid those extreme fluctuations. In your home, you can control humidity by adjusting the air conditioner or using dehumidifiers or humidifiers where needed. Now mostly in Florida we don't need to use humidifiers because it's always too wet. We need to control the mold and the mildew so we need to use the dehumidifiers. Uh, again, you want to avoid using attics or garages as storage places. Um, we, most of us don't have basements, but that's another place that can be very damp. You don't want to store things in a basement um, if you can avoid it. I also like people to keep their windows shut because opening your windows creates different climates in your house. And again, you can have those rapid changes. Um, I know for me in particular too, the pollen gets in. Um, and I, I don't open my windows because I'm really allergic to the pollen. But you'll see later on why uh, pollen can be a, a deteriorating factor. Light is another really important factor to control. Um, there are different components of light that are damaging to objects. It's the ultraviolet light. And we know this because we know our skin is damaged by the ultraviolet light from the sun. Um, and so can uh, textiles and objects that have been dyed. This is a basket, a Native American basket, that we have in our collection. And this happened long before we got it. But you can see the area that was covered by the lid still maintains the original color, whereas the up the area that was whoops, um, exposed to the light faded drastically. Um, so you want to keep your objects out of the sunlight and um, fluorescent lights emit UV so you want to keep them uh, away from fluorescent lights. Um, incandescent lights, now most of us don't even use those anymore, but um, incandescent and halogen lights produce not only uh, damaging light, but also heat. And I think most places have gotten uh, away from using halogen lights. The LED lights that are now available are really great because they don't emit heat and they don't emit a lot of damaging radiation, light radiation. Um, now the problem with light is that the effects are cumulative. So um, once an object has been exposed to light, you can't fix that. And the, the cumulative effects are related both to the length of exposure um, and the level of light. Um, so something that's had a short-term exposure to high levels of light can be as damaged as something that's has a long-term exposure to low levels of light. Um, and not only can the light cause fading, but it can also cause drying and embrittlement. 
And uh, there are a lot of ways that you can protect your objects from light. You can use uh, drapes in your house. You can keep objects away from um, sitting under a lamp. But again, now with the LED lights, a lot has changed in the past several years. Um, you can filter UV lights. This is um, an example of a, a filter that wraps around a fluorescent tube that will cut down on the UV light. That it, it blocks the UV light from being admitted. Um, and again, you don't want to put sensitive objects near windows, so paintings, artwork, um, things like the basket, the dyed basket, you want to keep them away from the sunlight. If you look in your room where you have artwork displayed and you follow how the sun goes around the room during the day, you can pick out a place where the artwork is not in any direct sunlight any time of the day. One of the things that we do and that you can do as well is we, we rest objects. We remove them from display periodically and replace them with other objects if we have objects to replace them with. Um, but you have to remember again that that light damage cannot be undone. So resting an object won't undo the damage, but it will prevent further damage. So um, things like vintage clothing, if you have that on display. A friend of mine has an old um, seamstress form, sewing form, and she has a um, vintage nightgown displayed on that. So um, if you do something like that, you want to make sure that periodically you put it away um, or put something, another piece of clothing that you have on it. Um, now, pests can be really damaging to objects. And you know also in Florida, not only do we have a lot of humidity, we have a lot of pests. And there are lots of different kinds of pests that can cause harm. <clears throat> Mice and roaches chew things. They leave urine and droppings that stain. And those stains are really difficult to remove. Most of the time you have to take that to a conservator to have them use special chemicals and things to remove those stains. Um, and the mice can just chew through, I can't even believe how much stuff I've had, not heirlooms, but other stuff, because I had a way they were getting into my kitchen and going in my kitchen drawers and chewing my pot holders and my spatulas and my, yeah, it was horrible. Um, so they can do a lot of damage in a short period of time. Moths and silverfish eat holes in clothes, but also in paper. So you have to be really careful. And in Florida, we get a lot of silverfish. You'll find areas, especially if it's like a closet that's damp and that is dark a lot. They love damp, dark places. Um, beetles and termites, we all know, destroy wood. Um, and it's the warm, damp conditions and any dust or dirt or um, food sources for insects like paper and protein and all different kinds of uh, materials that they like to eat. Um, that encourages them to stay. You can look for signs of infestation. You can find egg cases, larvae, or sometimes even active bugs. Um, We've occasionally gotten things that somebody wanted to donate. And what we do at the museum is we do not bring them into the museum directly until we've checked them for pests. And we've had a couple of times have rugs donated or textiles and opened them up. And actually, the moths have flown out of the textile. But we have a way to fumigate things on campus um, because we have a a pest control unit on campus. Um, anyway, I'll talk a little bit about that more later. Um, if you see holes or what we call frass, that's wood dust. Say if you see a piece of furniture and you see some sawdust around the bottom or under a drawer, um, that's a sign that you might have uh, termites or actually centipedes also will drill holes into um, wooden furniture. 
So the best protection for pests is to keep the, your house clean. Keep the house dusted and vacuumed, close gaps that allow pests to get into your house, eliminate sources of water and food for them, not only the food that we eat, but as I said, the um, other things that they like to eat. Um, a lot of smaller pests um, like to eat the, the glues in things, um, for example. You need to check your storage areas regularly because the sooner that you find a pest infestation, the easier it is to take care of and the less damage you will have in the long run. Check the objects that you're bringing into your home. As I said, we, we check them before we bring them into the museum. And at home, you can do a couple of things. You can isolate them for um, a couple of weeks and re-examine them for signs of infestation. You can isolate them in plastic bags or in plastic sheeting so that you can monitor them over the course of a, a couple of weeks. Because sometimes it's really hard to see the eggs or the larva. And um, those, it's the larva that does the most damage. But it's hard to see them and so if you um, if you set it aside for a little while, you'll start to see those signs. Um, if you find something that is infested, you need to get it taken care of, fumigated or treated. Um, for, pe for individuals, the thing that I recommend is calling the different pest control companies, like uh, Florida Pest Control, and there are others, local companies in your area, um, some of those companies are very good at working with objects and you can talk to them about what you have and then they can say yes we can do it, no we can't. Um, there are new methods that we use for treating pests, freezing and anoxic treatments, that means removing all the oxygen, but those are really difficult for an individual to do. Your pest control company might use those types of um, methods, but probably not too many of them do that. And the freezing has to be done a special way. You can't just put it in your freezer because it cannot be a frost-free freezer where the temperature goes up above freezing and down and up and down because that will kill off the animal or, the, or their eggs or the larva. Now believe it or not, um, what I wanted to tell you about this, you can see the back of the grandfather clock where the termites have eaten away. And the problem with things like that is they usually set up against a wall. And you don't even know that you have a problem until it's become a big problem. The, uh, the quill work was eaten by um, probably some kind of beetle. Um, now the, the mask, that's an interesting case because that was a wooden mask from Indonesia. It was, um, the insects were inside the nose and they chewed out the inside of the nose and then when somebody picked it up and picked it up improperly, their thumb punched through the nose and broke the nose. So that's two things, pest damage and improper handling, which I will talk about in a minute. Um, now, these things you wouldn't think about so much. They're dust, pollutants, smog, um, pollen, as I talked about. Some materials are made out of non-archival things, like plywood is made out of wood chips and formaldehyde and formaldehyde glues. Um, and all of that material, if it's non-archival, off-gas, off gases, chemicals that deteriorate your objects. The, the dust and the pollution in the air, uh, dust is abrasive, pollen is abrasive. If you've ever seen um, a microscopic view of pollen grains, they look like spiky balls and rough coral and all kinds of things, so they're abrasive. Um, 
the chemicals in the air like sulfur and nitrogen mix with the moisture in the air and create sulfuric and nitric acid. All of this is on a microscopic level, as I said earlier, so you don't see it until the damage is done. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes you will see an object that's been dusted a lot, um, that's gotten scratches in it, you know, fine scratches. Um, so it's just all of these things contribute to decaying your object. Um, Ordinary plastic bag, cardboard boxes emit acids and additives, as I said. Um, and when there's a lot of heat or moisture in the air or small closed spaces, all of that is magnified. Um, so again, good housekeeping, uh, keeping the air circulating. Don't store fit something in a, in a closet and leave it there. Um, I don't really use those dry cleaner bags. I take my clothes out. I don't use store anything in those plastic bags in Florida. And I've got an example of an old garment bag that you can look at afterwards that was made out of polyvinyl chloride plastic, and it's actually sticky now. Um, Anything that says it's PVC, which means polyvinyl chloride, again, the chloride mixes with the moisture in the air and creates hydrochloric acid, and that's why that plastic breaks down and gets sticky. Okay, let's see. Um, if you're using a material, it should be called archival or acid-free. Uh, papers and boxes should be termed lignin-free or acid-free. Uh, and all of those kinds of materials are available from these archival supply companies. Um, I did forget to say at the beginning, I have not only, I have two handouts. One is a list of um, helpful books and pamphlets and um, a list of the suppliers. Another, whoops, another one is the list of all these materials that I've been talking about this evening. Um, if you would like a copy, you, there I have a sheet there you can sign up and I will email or mail you a copy of these handouts. I don't print them out anymore because um, it was a lot of a waste of paper. Um, so, right. so they're, they're you can look through them later at the end. Um, but anyway, if you'd like a copy, you can let me know. Um, now, earlier I referred to, um, I think that might have skipped. No, okay. Um, well, this was, look, it has a mind of its own. This is one of the ways that we protect objects um, from dust and pollutants. We cover the actual storage units with um, some kind of material like plastic sheeting or this was an old uh, silk parachute from uh, an army surplus store. That's long, we've had to get rid of that finally. After about 50 years, it finally came apart. But um, I had a student sew me a nice cover for that rug rack out of uh, muslin. So muslin you can use. This is a, an archaeological pot. We've made a mount for it out of this ethophone, and there's some examples on the table. And then we've covered it with a polyethylene plastic to protect it. All right, let's see. Okay. So, as, you, as I said earlier, there's one of those major categories that can cause damage is object use. Um, any use of an object over time, of course, causes wear and tear. So, I just tell people to use their heirlooms judiciously. I know that um, most people have heirlooms for a reason, and they want to display them, they want to use them, they want to um, show them off. So I, what I recommend is that um, 
perhaps you only want to use them for a special occasion, a certain holiday or um, an event, a family event perhaps, um, a birthday, um, but it's totally your decision. You have to assess the value of the object to you and how long you want it to last and then evaluate the risks in handling or displaying that object. Um, and that's just something that you have to decide for yourself. These are a couple of ways that, well, I show the good handling and the bad handling. This is how we roll our Navajo rugs. We wear gloves and we roll them on acid-free tubes and that tube happens to be covered with acid-free tissue, that white. This is um, an ivory horn and the woman has just picked it up and you can see that it's left fingerprints where she's picked it up. This is from a book that's over on the table. A conservator wrote a book on handling objects and she drew these cartoons. Um, okay, let's see the next slide. These are a couple of ways that illustrate the proper ways to handle objects with any, well, okay, got it. These clicker things are just their own, how far did that go? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, there we go, sorry. Um, this is showing how you should handle something that has appendages like handles. Um, you want to create a nice padded environment. You can use towels, you can use um, bubble wrap covered with tissue paper, acid-free tissue. There are foam, I have examples of um, polyfoam over there. And you want to handle it with both hands. So when I pick up an object that has handles or uh, a spout or something like that, I pick it up by the side and underneath and carry it to where I'm going. Uh, we use cotton gloves. We also have now started using nitrile gloves. Um, and those you can get in the um, Walgreens, Walmart, any pharmacy, CVS. They carry nitrile gloves now. I don't keep latex gloves because so many people have become allergic to latex. Um, I have a volunteer who hates the nitro gloves, so she still uses the cotton gloves. You have to assess whether or not um, the cotton gloves should be used. If you have a decaying or powdery surface, then, or if there's a danger of catching on a rough spot, then use a, a plastic glove, nitro, or I think. Walgreens and other places sell what they call vinyl gloves, so they're non-latex as well. Um, you want to remove jewelry. You don't want necklaces or bracelets or rings that are going to um, knock into the object. Um, when you're working with small objects, I put them on a padded surface um, or in a little tray. I, use, um, I have boxes that have lids and I use those lids as trays. Um, if you have something that has multiple parts, like a cup and saucer or a teapot with a lid, you should move those individually. Um, or make sure that the, for example, on the teapot that the lid is secured before you move it around. Um, this is just an example. What we don't think about when we're moving things is these objects are old they're not in the same condition as modern objects that we have. We don't know what condition they're in. We don't know how fragile they are. So we have to treat everything old as if it's very fragile and could break or could come apart when we're handling things. Um, again, this is be careful handling things that you don't know if they're fragile or not. Um, this is that example, the wood mask where the person punched through with their thumb when they picked it up. Um, this is a, that same pot that I showed you earlier, and what we've done with this, again, we've used the ethophone, 
and it's carved out. There's a circular carve area in there, so it sits down in the foam. We've used two pieces, and then that's its storage mount. This, we put a piece of black fabric on it, and we can display it right in its storage mount. So we can take it to our exhibits building, cover it with a um, fabric, and we're done. Um, again, if you have, you should never carry a lot of objects at the same time. We usually only carry one thing at a time. Or we get a cart and we put things on the cart. If you put something on a cart, you have to make sure that it's stable, that it's not going to rock around or tip over. Um, and you can use padding to hold it. Sometimes I'll lay something on its side and use a roll of bubble wrap to secure it till I get it moved. Um, things can be heavy. So if you have a heavy object, make sure that you get enough people to help you move it. If you can't, don't think you can move it yourself. Because um, I've seen people, first of all, you can injure yourself. Secondly, you can injure the object. Uh, you should not smoke or eat in the areas where you're working with your object. Now, in your home, when you're displaying your objects, of course you're going to be eating in various areas if you have a party or something. But um, I don't want to sit, for example, if I'm using my laptop and I want to eat while I'm using my laptop, I take my TV tray and put it next to the table and my food and my drink are on the table. Usually I do not eat when I'm working on the laptop. I just have a drink there and I don't get it anywhere near my laptop. Um, so that's just an example. You don't want to be right next to something. Um, again, it's your decision. Do you want to use your old antique uh, dishware for a party or something? It's your decision. If you really want to use it, you should. But remember that that's going to take some wear. It's going to make some wear and tear on the on the plates or the dishware. Um, Let's see. I've gotten through all of that. Um, there are special objects that we have to take very, we have to be very careful with. For example, firearms. Old firearms should never be loaded unless you're sure if you're going to use them and you know that they're safe to use. Um, they should never be stored loaded. Um, Pharmaceutical objects, old medicine bottles, um, old containers of medicines, they can be poisonous, they can be combustible, uh, and so you want to be very careful if there's contents left in those um, types of objects. Uh, with paper documents and photographs, slides, sound recordings, video recordings, digital recordings, what we do with those is often we'll make a copy and we'll use the copy, say for exhibit or um, if you're doing, say, a genealogical study and you want to share some photographs with your family, make copies or make them wear gloves because photographs, any photographic material is very susceptible to the oils on your fingers. And I have seen photographs and metals too that have been etched permanently etched and show the fingerprint um, on the object. Um, okay. This is an example of proper and improper cleaning. Um, sometimes we do have to clean our objects. We, we want to clean them. And there are certain things that you can do. Uh, detergents and soaps can leave harmful residues. Um, we try to use things like, um, if we're going to try to wash something, we just use a damp rag, or you can use a little bit of woolite. I don't know if they still make ivory snow. We used to use that uh, if we wanted to wash something. You have, If you have an old um, piece of clothing, 
Think very long and hard before you wash it. And don't put it in the washing machine. Do it by hand. Um, I've heard people would put things out in the sun to bleach them. If you have um, a textile, uh, say a table runner, a, a tablecloth, or a piece of clothing that have spots, do, don't put it out in the sun because you're getting that UV light. Um, don't put bleach on it either because that's got chlorine in it. Uh, you can scrub or polish an object where you actually remove the overplating. Many metals, for example, brass was often silver plated. Silver is often gold plated. And you have to be really careful. So what's happened with this object, this was silver and you can see the brass here where they've over polished and scrubbed off the silver plating. Unfortunately, some of the polishes that you get in the store, they're not liquid, they're um, paste, and they can be, they're abrasive. So you have to be very, very careful. Some of the liquids, the chemicals are abrasive in a different way. They're, they're bad chemicals to use on the objects. Um, another thing to think about is that um, the use and the wear are part of the object's history. So you don't want to take away that history. Um, it may have a sentimental value, say, um, I don't, can't think of an example, but, but that sign of being used is, is, is as important as the object being clean or brand new looking. Um, we really tell people to try not to return something to looking brand new. I know there's that famous example from Antiques Roadshow where somebody removed the varnish, the black varnish, from a piece of furniture and the guys told them how much they had decreased the value by taking that black varnish off the furniture. Um, all right. A lot of times people want to try to repair their heirlooms. Uh, that is a very specific study. Conservators repair things. They study for a long time learning how to properly repair items. We have, this is actually an object from our collection. It's an archaeological pot, a thousand or so years old. Can you see where the scotch tape was stuck to it? And that won't come off. There's nothing that I can use on it to take that off now. Scotch tape on the document. On the, it was on the back, but it's bled through to the front. Uh, what is it, a chemical reaction? Right, because those tapes have acidic glue, basically, the glue. And it, it damage, you know, it de breaks down the objects, but also then makes them, you know, stains them like this. It's, it's basically burning the, the paper. Um, that, the pot, let's see, I've got, got it the right way. That is the residue from the tape. And because it's so, it was so on there for so long, it's kind of melded with the ceramic and you can't, you can't use any chemical to get it off with. Um, it just won't come off. Okay, these, this is glue. So I'm sure you all remember rubber cement and we had scrapbooks and we put everything in the scrapbooks with rubber cement and this is what happens, it comes through. These are photographs where that glue, whatever they used, has come through and stained the photograph. Be, be wary of home remedies that um, your grandmother might have told you or mother, you know, to get white rings off furniture, use this or use that or make this or that. Uh, a lot of times those are made out of materials or chemicals that will actually damage the object. Um, 
people in the past have used products to fill in holes in wooden furniture and that can actually create stresses as it dries out and gets moist and dry and it, that can crack the furniture further. Um, there's wood putty on the market and just that should not be used on antique furniture to repair antique furniture. Um, so these are some of the ways, some of the materials that we use to store our objects in. Um, these are some acid-free boxes with interior cartons, trays, um, reme and polyester, um, mat board, acid-free paper. I've got a lot of that stuff that you can look at after we're finished. Um, one of the things that most of us have in our houses are wooden cabinets. Say I'm a china cabinet. You may have a, a wooden cabinet that you store things in. Um, if you buy something new, uh, say an um, unfinished, unpainted wooden cabinet, if you want to paint it, then you should use water-based acrylic paint. Don't use oil-based anymore because oil-based, first of all, takes forever to off-gas, and that means that it's releasing vapors and products that, because you can smell that, um, you can smell latex, water-based paint. And if you paint something, you need to let it, um, you need to let that off-gassing happen, and so you, you need to let it sit for a couple of weeks before you use it. Um, if you do have a wooden cabinet, like a china cabinet uh, or something that you use, we can put, there's special materials we can put down. You could put down um, the mylar. Um, there's a piece of mylar up there. Um, or what we call marble seal. And I think that may be, um, hopefully that'll, you'll see that in a little bit. Um, these are some of the cabinets that we use. We have old map cases that we use, and we cover the bottoms. These are the artifacts are on top of the of the foam and the tissue that we use to fill the trays. Um, you can cover if you have shelving units. You can cover the racks with foam and tissue, or just the foam. Um, again, these are examples. This is the marble seal. It's mylar on the top and um, aluminum foil on the back side. And if you put that down on top of a wooden shelf, then the materials from the wood, they're stopped by the aluminum. They can't come up through the aluminum. Um, and so we use that a lot to create barriers um, for some of our objects and some of our storage units. Um, when you speak mm -hmm. of, of foam, are you talking just plain styrofoam? No. Oh, okay. Styrofoam contains chlorides and it breaks down. If you look at, um, and there's that yellow foam, that's urethane. Mm -hmm. And that too, that produces uric acid or uremic acid. And you'll see old pieces of that. You pick them up and your fingers just go through and they break down, they're brittle. Um, so, so special. Yeah, okay. yeah, and actually... Um, and it's treated, I assume, is that... It's not, it's the way it's made. It's oh, not treated. Okay. It's made out of either polyethylene or polypropylene oh, or polystyrene. Okay. And again, if you want to come over at the end, I can show you all these different materials. And they're also marked. I've marked everything, so most everything, so you can see what it is. Um, okay, let's continue on here. There we go. We saw that already. Um, textile boxes, you can order those from Gaylord and the tissue to um, store your clothing in. If you do want to store uh, like a quilt or a blanket, um, if you don't want to roll it, you can fold it up, but you need to pad those folds. And what we do is we roll up acid-free tissue and we stick it in the fold so that it's not, um, if you fold this, it gets creased and over the years that 
that breaks the fibers in the clothing or in the textile. Um, if you have, um, let's see, if you have multiple pieces, you can store them in um, a box or in a tray, like the tray that I showed you. Let's see, let's go back. Uh, that, those kind of trays, so that you can separate the objects. Uh, the, all of this stuff is available to the individual, um, as I said earlier. Now, let me go forward. Okay, let's stop there. This is a Sue, it's a baby, baby's cap. Um, all we've done is wadded up acid-free tissue so that we, it will help it maintain its shape. It's leather, and then this is all quill work, porcupine quills that they prepared and dyed and used. Um, they used a lot of those before they got trade beads. Um, what about those, the Seminole clothing that you showed mm -hmm. a, little, a while ago? Right. What, what do you store that stuff in? We, um, we store it in, um, in drawers in these big cabinets that we have. And what's that you, with, like tissue? Or? Foam and tissue. Foam and and, but you can you could store it in one of these big textile boxes. So if you hang it up and hang it out in the air, it will deteriorate. Well, let me show you the next. You can hang certain fabric. And the, the thing about the seminal textiles that's good, anything that's cotton or muslin, um, rayon, can be hung. You know, um, oh. polyesters. So we create these padded hangers. And you, you can buy them, but they're really expensive. So I take plastic hangers, and I take um, that um, batting that you use to make quilts with, and I wrap it around, and then I cover it with muslin or Tyvek. Now, Tyvek's great, but it's super expensive. Um, so you would, I would recommend that you just go to the fabric store and buy muslin. If you buy fabric at the fabric store, you need to wash it in woolite or something like that before you use it, because they have additives sometimes that you can wash out. Um, this shows an example of, they've taken an old hanger and used that batting, and this is the Tyvek, but muslin does just as well. Then you can see this small, the small things in a box. Um, Another thing that we do is simply create, this is a, a, a basket, and I've cut a piece of mat board. You can't see it, really. I'm sorry about that. It's sitting on a piece of mat board, and then I slid the whole thing into uh, um, a bag, a polyethylene bag. Now, I didn't close the bag, because the problem with bags is if you close them, you can get, sometimes you can get condensation inside. So that's... Um, we try to keep the things open and air moving. Um, okay. Um, oops. This is an example of what I meant by padding things that areas that can get creased. This is just again just just a wad of acid-free paper or tissue, and we've supported the shoulders of the object there. Um, These are small objects. Again, you can see all the different ways that these acrylic boxes you can buy from Gaylord. The um, paper boxes you can buy from Gaylord. This is stored on a piece of that batting tissue, these small trays. This is silver cloth, and I'm sure if you have silver collections, um, if you have silverware, say, and they used to come in these boxes, and inside the box was this um, brown fabric. That has a corrosion inhibitor sewn into the fabric. So the little pieces of metal in the fabric corrode so that your silver doesn't. Now, sometimes you end up having to replace that, but you can buy that and they now make um, 
bags out of it. They make coin holders out of it. I have a different kind of a coin holder over there for you to look at. Um, but that's really great stuff. Um, okay. Oops. Um, we've made our own. We made our own tray with dividers out of um, an acid-free box. We cut up other boxes and made it ourselves. This is acid-free tissue that's been pleated. These are, are archaeological bone points. And we just pleated the paper. Now, I didn't do that. That's old, but we still use that technique. Bags, again, storing things in bags. Um, Ziploc bags are polyethylene. So if you buy Ziploc bags in the store, you can use them. Uh, Rubbermaid containers do not have non-archival archival additives. You can use those as well. Um, this is um, an example where we took some foam sheeting and cut out cavities. This is a bubble wrap and we cut out a cavity for a bone pin, bone point. And then all these layers go in this acid-free box. So bubble wrap is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, bubble wrap's interesting because you can use it with certain things and you, can use, you can't use it with other things. Bubble wrap can leave an impression. I, there's an example of a painting that was shipped that had, um, which I don't have a picture of, unfortunately, where the bubble wrap actually imprinted itself on the, into the paint. Um, I've seen a piece of ceramic, it, it imprinted itself on the, the glaze of that ceramic. Uh, so you have to be really careful. What we normally do is wrap stuff in acid-free tissue and then wrap it in the bubble wrap. There's very few things where I actually let the bubble wrap touch the object. Now this is, this is a bone pin and I know the bubble wrap's not going to affect it in any way. So, um, Documents, you can get these boxes. You can buy acid-free folders. You can make, make your own. For This is a, a book and they've made a folder for... You can actually buy these too, already made. Um, Gaylord. I use Gaylord for almost everything. Um, uh, these clamshell boxes for photographs um, interleaved with acid-free tissue or there's sheets you can buy. Um, Gaylord, that company, sells a lot of things in small quantities and good prices. Off Every once in a while, there's something that I need, that you might need, that you can't get from Gaylord, university products. But they're really expensive. Now, they sell in small quantities, too. So unless I can't get it anyplace else, then I buy university products. Hollinger, Metal Edge, and the catalogs are up there. They, um, they are, have good prices, and they also sell in small quantities. These, this is an old metal slide um, box, and they're still good because these are enamel. They're, they're powder, what they call powder coated, where the paint was applied in powder form electrochemically to the metal. So they don't off gas and they don't, um, they don't deposit anything on the artifacts or on the specimens. Um, This is really important. If you have a piece of artwork that you want to have framed, make sure you ask the place that you go, the framer, do they use archival mat board? Do they use or do they do archival framing? Um, because if they don't, they're using cardboard and acidic emitting papers. Um, if you get a piece of artwork and they put a plexi cover on it rather than glass, that's okay. You can't do it for pastels or charcoal because it creates electrostatic and it will pull the charcoal, it will pull the pastel chalk off up onto the um, plexiglass. 
So, and these good framers should know these things. Um, now, recordings. Some of us have old records, CDs, um, tapes maybe still, and you can buy specially sized boxes. You can buy these um, paper, acid-free paper sleeves for records. For photographs and um, record, the records are supposed to be stored, you might be able to help me with this, Rick. They're supposed to be stored vertically, I think, yes. Photographs should be stored horizontally. If you have to stack boxes, if you're storing things in boxes, remember to put the heaviest box on the bottom so that you don't crush the, the other boxes. Um, well, let me go back and, okay, let me make sure. I think there were some other things on the recordings. Um, again, with recordings, you can copy them sometimes and use the copies. Um, right now, there's equipment out where you can record your own old records onto a CD. Now CDs are becoming passe, but I've been doing that with a lot of my records because I still have a CD player. Um, there's a lot more going on digitally now, so you can investigate various digital methods. Um, what, one of the things we're doing at the museums are, are making uh, 3D copies of objects. So we may make a 3D copy for that people can handle for educational programs or for exhibit if the object is too fragile to go out on exhibit. So, and that's becoming more and more available to the general public. Um, so in general, in conclusion, if you're comfortable, your objects will be comfortable. Uh, so again, avoid those extremes of temperature and humidity. Um, if you want to hang something, interior walls, interior rooms, interior closets are more stable than those on the exterior. And you can feel that sometimes. I don't have that great insulation in my house. And I can feel, um, sometimes I open my dishwasher and it's really hot in my dishwasher because it's on an outside wall. So just think about those things when you're thinking about what to do with your, um, with your objects. Limit the light exposure, inspect your heirlooms regularly, be gentle when you're cleaning them. Um, if you want to repair them, call a museum, ask them if they can put you in touch with a conservator or ask them how they would repair it. Um, I can do certain repairs myself because I've studied that. Um, but if it's really worthwhile to you to pay a conservator, they'll do it correctly. Um, but a lot of museums, all of us who deal with collections in museums have these connections to um, other people that can help you. Um, and avoid the quick fix it or do it, do it yourself treatments. Um, and one thing that we suggest, anything if you do alter an object, Make sure it's something that you can undo. You saw with the glues and the tapes, you can't undo those. Um, all right, so I'm happy to take questions now. Uh, we can, I can do it now, we can go over to the table. Yes? Before I knew anything about acid-free photo albums, mm -hmm. I put some photos, old photos, right. in one of those Remember the magnetic? The magnetic, photo? yes. yes. Those, some of those photos, in fact, the majority of them now have mildew on them. Right. right. What can I do with those? Okay, so there's two issues with that because the mildew, um, mildew is hard to clean because if you use alcohol, um, you can damage leather, you can da photographs are very susceptible to damage of any kind of, from any kind of chemical or from handling. Yeah, what I would, kind of yes, exactly. What I would suggest for your photographs is that you um, 
use, now we have a vacuum cleaner where we can adjust the, um, the suction. If you have one, put it on the lowest suction, use a soft brush or just the edge of your, the hose and vacuum it. Um, if your vacuum cleaner has a HEPA filter, a lot of them do now, that's even better because it'll catch the mold spores. And then throw that filter away, clean up the vacuum cleaner parts with alcohol. You can use rubbing alcohol you get from the store. Um, but just be really careful with that. So before I take the photo and put it in an acid-free album, right. I need to clean it first. You do, because mold will spread. And you'll then infect, you'll contaminate the new acid-free. <laughs> and the other problem you're going to have with that is those, mag those strips that they were magnetic, mm -hmm. um, they're glue strips actually, and you're going to have a lot of trouble getting them off. I noticed. Um, so what I did, I took a really thin metal spatula, because we got an album donated, and I just carefully worked that spatula under the photographs. Um, most of them came up pretty well, but you might get a little bit of tearing. So you just have to be really careful. Thank you. Yes. You put your feet? Yeah, uh, laminating. Will you comment on that? Mm -hmm. um, unless you know what the plastic is that you're laminating, I don't recommend it. The other thing with laminating is that it creates a microclimate and you can get, um, unless it's done really well, you can get condensation inside the laminate. Also, the problem is once it's laminated, you can't undo it. But you weren't um, supposed to do anything that you couldn't reverse. Right, right. And what there's lots of different types of mylar envelopes and plastic envelopes you can order from Gaylord to put things in. Some of them close, some of them haven't, the opening, it doesn't zip close or anything. We use those for a lot of photographs, documents, um, because they can be taken in and out of those envelopes. I really love, there's some, there's, um, and I have some of those too, they're sleeves, plastic sleeves, all made out of the polyethylene, that can go into a notebook and they come, they can hold negatives, three by, uh, three by five photograph, five, four by six, five by seven, eight by 10, all different, they come in all different slides, all different sizes, so, um, and they're also available. Um, and I, I store most of our photographs in those, so. Yes? You mentioned the process of removing the oxygen Right. Could you uh, describe what that is? Is it a chamber? And then what it's for and what you would mm -hmm. normally use it for? Okay. And that process is going to be something that you probably can't do by yourself at home. There's a number of different methods. You can make a, a chamber that you can seal really well. Um, we also use that marble steel. We make envelopes because it, it can be heat sealed on the edges. Um, and then um, there are packets that are called oxygen scavengers, and you put those in before you seal the bag. Um, there's a formula for figuring out how many you need. Um, the chamber, you then have equipment to suck out all the oxygen. Some of them replace it with nitrogen. Um, it's such a complicated process that I don't know anybody who can really do it at home. Um, but again, if you're, if you have a, one object or so, maybe somebody in a museum can help. Um, Is it for paper, articles? It's for everything. Oh. Um, in fact, Vizcaya has done it with big pieces of furniture. They've created these huge envelopes and um, then use the equipment, the vacuum equipment to, and the oxygen scavengers to um, suck out all the oxygen. The problem with part of it is if you do it, sometimes it gets too dry in the envelope and so there's all these equations you have to use to figure out 
do I need to put a humidifier in there or do I need to make it dry or do I need to make it wetter um, if I'm doing something organic. So fortunately for us, we still have people on campus. But And like I said, I don't know what some of the pest control companies are doing. I don't know if they've adopted these new methods because they're not poisonous to us, not to the, you know, well, of course, if you're in a room and you remove all the oxygen, you're going to die. But <laughs> um, they're better ways than the old pest.